My heart breaks for the violence and the deaths and all the upheaval going on now in the Holy Land. And not just for the Jews in Israel, but also for the Arabs and the Muslims in Gaza and elsewhere. I should say our heart breaks. It may sound naive, but the big question, of course, is will there ever be peace in the Middle East? Every death is terrible, but especially here in the holiest part of the world, holy to the three major religions, starting from Judaism, Christianity, Islam, a place that has dominated headlines from the beginning of time, the beginning of history. Why, oh why? That's what we will be discussing. Please join me. Will there ever be peace in the Middle East? Hello, my name is Simon Jacobson. and We will be discussing, will there ever be peace in the Middle East? This program is dedicated in honor of the yard site, the 15th of Sivan, of my beautiful beloved mother. This is the dedicator saying, Sarah Bat Shmuel Weinstock, Zachrena Levracha, Sylvia Weinstock Rosen, mother, grandmother, great grandmother. Will there ever be peace in the Middle East? What a question. Our hearts break every time you see a person die for no reason. Frankly, even someone that dies at old age is also a heartbreak, but especially in the violence that has erupted now yet again in the Middle East, in Israel. And especially being the Holy Land, the Holy Land, it goes back thousands of years, biblical times, the promised land. A place that is considered holy by the major religions of this, country, of this world. And when I say my heart breaks, our heart breaks, I don't just mean for the Jews who are being attacked, civilians for no reason except being Jewish and living in Israel. But also for those Arabs and Muslims living in Gaza or elsewhere because we are all part of one collective whole, almost 8 billion people created by God. And it may sound naive, but you have to ask yourself the question, the child's question. What is going on here? Why can't human beings find a way to live side by side, even though they may have different opinions? Does it have to come down to this? I'm not a child any longer, and many of you are not. But sometimes it's good to ask that question from scratch. And I think about it from the beginning of time. There was once two human beings, the Bible tells us, Adam and Eve. They would be the ancestors of the entire human race. They would have children, their children would have children, grandchildren, and here we are. So really all one family that just branched off doesn't matter whether it's billions or millions or thousands or single or individuals. You go even more specifically regarding our immediate discussion. Abraham was called Av Hamoin Goyim, the father of all nations. He had a son, Yishmael, a son, Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob, twins. And this Abraham is our common grandfather, the common grandfather of all Jews, of all Muslims and Arabs. Let's just say first Arabs, then Muslims. And all Christians, Roman, Western world, grandchildren of Esau. So the family unit is even stronger than going just back to Adam. 
So yes, I discussed in the last class I gave 3,330 years from Sinai. Why is Israel still burning? Discussed the philosophical, theological, and spiritual digression of these children and how that evolved. But being that we do share one common ancestor, wouldn't it make sense that all of us should ask the big question, what, is our, what would our grandfather say? What would Abraham say? I have friends that are not Jewish, that are Muslim, and that are Christian. We'll talk about Muslim. And I've asked them. Time and again, I said, we have a great-grandfather. His name was Abraham. When they were infidels, he actually prayed for them. The wicked city of Sodom, Abraham prayed for them. So why don't we learn from Abraham that even when we have religious passions, why do we feel the need to have to hurt another? Especially if you think about it, that it's your cousin. And of course, I received the response, well, we're not the perpetrators. The Jews are. We've been living there for many years, Muslims, Arabs, and then the Jews decided to return. He used the word return, actually. So I said, return. So he says, yeah, but that's how it works in this world. Once you left, you left. So I, so, so I said, so what is this about a land grab? Whoever's there last? And second of all, the Jews never really left. There were always Jews there. And we continued to pray to it, and we always saw it as our homeland. We were banished from there. Now he's a decent person. I, don't, I wouldn't accuse him or suggest that he would do something violent. But there is definitely a philosophy. So I say, say to myself at times, can we sit down and actually have a conversation? Or will it get so, so entangled in old history and bad blood, and you did this and I did that, and fundamentals can never be reached? So call me naive again. But I would suggest not just sitting down at the negotiation table. Let's go back to the theological roots. Do we indeed share a destiny because we had a great-grandfather called Abraham? Did he stand for something? Even if we may have different interpretations or different approaches, is it impossible to imagine coexistence? And I'll, I'll speak, even though I'm Jewish and clearly biased, but let's for a moment, I'll step back. I'll even say that Jews made mistakes, Arabs, Muslims made mistakes. The, the general claim is that the Jews always fought, Israelis always fought a defensive war. In 1948, the Jews did not attack. They were given some slivers of land, but that was already too much. And every subsequent war was defensive. But let's even make the argument that the Jews made mistakes and they behaved in ways that some, not all, but some, But first of all, the other side has also made mistakes. So let's all acknowledge that no one here is perfect. So what would it take? Or do we resign ourselves to what most write today, reading articles, that this is a perpetual battle that will never end? There'll be lulls, there'll be years that there may be quiet, but it's a, it's a powder keg, it's a constant combustion chamber, and all you need is a spark and then explodes again. It's not like everything was peaceful. It's a state of war all the time. It's just the thing is people aren't fighting the war all the time. That is the prevalent opinion today. I have something inside of me does not accept that. And it's not just because I'm a royal optimist and a uh, suffering optimist or just always believe that uh, things can be better. Because I do believe fundamentally at the core and the essence of things. If you were able to get there, you could change. But the problem is power, politics, money, control comes into, into play. So just hypothetically, just indulge me for a moment. Let me suggest something. I don't think this is going to be resolved in Washington, in Moscow, in the Middle East, in Egypt, or anywhere else at a negotiating table, because this isn't a Western type of battle, so to speak. We negotiate, this one gives a little, this one gives, you come up to, term, come to terms and 
and they move forward. Like you see this all the time in corporate battles and so on. This goes into deep spiritual and religious beliefs. And once you bring God into the picture, it's extremely difficult to unravel because you're not fighting in your, in your mind. You're not fighting for yourself. You're fighting for what God wants. And people have very different views on that. The real battle, my friends, I believe, is in, our, is in the schools. As long as the schools teach a certain type of approach, I'm going to begin with the Arab Muslim world. Things are taught in the schools, children growing up with certain axioms and givens, that immediately creates the biggest problems of all. Because children are impressionable, their minds are not yet shaped, and when they hear hate, and they hear intolerance, ultimately, that's what will happen as they grow older. Now, some may be more progressive in thinking and may be more liberal thinking and not embrace certain, uh, certain extremist, extremist approach, but still, they'll be sympathetic to it. Now, I would say the same thing with Jewish schools, except I went to Jewish schools. I was not taught that every Muslim or Arab is a bad person. I looked at it more on the practical, pragmatic side, that the Jews are trying to live in peace and they're being attacked. The fact that the Jews came there after World War II or earlier is their full right to do so. Is it, is it connected to the anger of the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the humiliation? So first of all, why are Jews responsible for that? The Jews, were, if anything, were more subjugated by the nation, so to speak, over the centuries than anybody. Is it connected to the religious belief that Islam should dominate the world and Israel being controlled by Jews is uh, sacrilegious and defiant of that? Perhaps, in their minds, but you know what? This is where you sit down and you ask what God really wants. I understand there will be the two different opinions. But it really comes down to how you teach about God. I'll just speak from my understanding. God created all human beings on this earth. He said nowhere that one nation should annihilate another. I know you may ask the question, what about Amalek? What about this, the nations that lived in Israel? So Amalek is, is an exception, but that is like a nation born like Nazis. That's a, one exception, that's not the rule. As far as the nations, in Israel goes, it's not here is not the point of the discussion, but the point was that they had occupied Jewish land. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived there. Jacob went to Egypt, and then basically the land was stolen, according to the biblical na narrative. But here's not the place to go into that. The point of the matter is no one argues about the promised land and the holy land that is dictated in the Bible. If someone doesn't go to why the Bible and God, then we have a whole different discussion. But I'm going with a the theological approach. So then the question is, can there be living side by side? The answer is, if God created diversity, so why can't we accept diversity in a harmonious and peaceful way, bring people together? But that has to come down to the axioms in our education system, to what is taught at home and school. If you don't alter that, all other things are going to be futile. Yes, you can put out the fires. You can get a Band-Aid, a painkiller, but those are symptomatic short-term solutions. They will not last. I have no doubt that if we really went into the deeper guts of the education system, that would be the place of change. Now, of course, the argument is who controls the education system? It's the royal families, whether it's Saudi Arabia or the other Arab Arabian countries. The power, it's not controlled in any free way. You say, okay, let's start teaching them another approach, even to Islam. I understand that. That's why I suggested that this is theoretical, but it's doable. So will it take the overthrow of all these regimes who want control and don't want change, or they want change that works for them? Perhaps. Will that happen in time? Perhaps as well. What can we do about it? 
we do not buy, we should not buy into the myth or the narrative that it's impossible. It's not impossible. It seems impossible because look what's happening here. Whatever the whatever the provocation was, suddenly missiles are flying from Gaza, hitting civilian areas. Israel responds. We're not getting now into the issues of who's right and who's wrong. It's clear that we know who provoked it. Israel's response, or some say it's overreacting. It's not overreacting. Civilian and innocent civilians are being attacked. But when you have such a climate, hostile, intense climate, you're going to talk to me about education, re-educating the children. That's why I'm speaking in the long term. In short term, in short term, it's pretty clear. History is witness that when you have such type of um, hostility, the only way to approach it is with strength. Because you're dealing with something that's not rational. It's coming from a place that does not accept. If you don't accept the very existence of Israel and the Jews living there, so what are you supposed to do? That's called the declaration of war. Nobody wants to go to war. In World War II, nobody wanted to go to war. We're not talking about warmongers and those people who are violent or aggressive people. War is only a last option. You go to war when someone declares war on you. Hitler declared war on the Western world, on the Allies, in his own way. When someone declares war on you and says, I want your home, I want your city, I want your country, I want your land, I want your resources, so you try your best, and then you have to be wise and stop appeasing and stop trying to negotiate and realize you've got yourself a war, the last thing you want. Now, everyone talks about Neville Chamberlain's blunder where he came back as he was walking down the tarmac with a paper that we have peace in our times. And Hitler was already moving into the Sudetenland, into Czechoslovakia and, and further, and Poland. Yes, that was a blunder. His intentions were coming, maybe naive. He thought maybe we can negotiate something. I'm not defending him. But that's the tendency of human beings, is to try to do things in a peaceful way. Our own grandfather Jacob, when he had to confront his, when he realized that his brother, Esau, was going to war with him, so he prepared in three ways. He prayed, prepared a gift to appease him, and he also prepared for war. Now, thank God, he only needed the first two, the prayer and the appeasement, the bribery. He paid him, bought him off, essentially. But well, war is always the last option, but it has to be an option. So I cannot speak for every person on this earth, but I can say that most Jews and most Israelis I know, I would say almost all, maybe there are rare exceptions. I'm always saying that because I don't want to say every person on earth wants peace. It's the nature of our beings is to want peace. We want to have peace so we can bring up our families in a calm and peaceful environment to be able to live up to our values, the things that we believe in. I have to believe that the same is true with the Muslim Arab world. Even though Golda Meir famously said, when they will love their children more than they hate us, we'll have peace. So it's true that sometimes behavior clouds your judgment and you're ready to even hurt your own people. I mean, there's evidence where Hamas and other terrorists Activity takes place either beneath or within hospitals where children are living schools. I mean, that means you're ready to put at risk your own people for your beliefs. I don't care what the justification is, but that means that you're not thinking about the fundamental principle. But the first thing is to bring up your family in a beautiful way. Now, I can understand if you're a radical, you say this is what God wants, so when God wants something, you're ready to sacrifice your own children. And some maybe even think it's quote-unquote admirable. That's a very difficult thing to battle. That's why I invoke the religious argument. Because you're not going to win an argument like that with practical suggested or uh, mediation and uh, Western-style negotiations. No, if somebody's ready to raise their own children means that their beliefs are so deeply embedded you're not going to negotiate it with money or something of that nature. 
That's why it has to go back to the belief system itself, and especially how, as it's inculcated in the children. That's definitely the long term. Short term, it's going to be strength. You, you achieve peace through strength. That's what you do in time of war. Why is it at the end of a war, like the end of World War II, that the Allies, the United States and the Allies, demanded unconditional surrender from Germany? Let them save face. So it'll be a conditional surrender. Why do you insist on unconditional surrender? Basically also humiliating them. Because when there's a war, there has to be very clear boundaries. Just like this is the enemy and this is the friend. The same thing. Who won, who lost. You can't leave one shred, even one shred of thought or idea in the enemy that they may have won one little thing. Because then you really have not finished the problem. And a fire is burning... You can't say, you know what, I'll leave a little fire burning in a corner just to save face. You have to extinguish the fire. Is it humiliating? Yes. But the war began by the Axis, by the Nazis, and therefore they had to completely surrender. As soon as you allow an enemy to feel that they have something, some foothold, you have yourself a problem. That's why really winning a war is not just winning technically who's in control of your country or city, but it's also the minds of the people. Because as long as you have a resistance there, so yes, they may be quiet for a while, but you haven't fundamentally changed their attitude. So what you see here is that you need two things to have achieve peace in the Middle East or achieve peace anywhere. One is that strength to say, there was, yes, a war was fought. I didn't want this war. You brought it upon me. Now there's a winner and a loser. In 1967, well, there was a clear winner and loser where all the Arab countries attacked Israel. And Israel came out victorious, literally in a miraculous way, in six days. Its land tripled. So then, okay, you win the war. But what happened, unfortunately, which is another discussion, but it's relevant, is that the Israelis themselves made the enemy and the losers feel that they've won something. They gave them back the keys to the Temple Mount and other things of that nature. Now, all with good intentions, but you know what? Then you created a monster. I remember I was in 1971 in Israel the first time. I was a 14-year-old boy. I was able to go anywhere. I went on Arab buses and Arab taxis. I went to Hebron and to the west to to, uh, to, to the old city, the Arab quarter, places that you're not supposed to go to today. And it was not an issue. No one even told me there was a problem. It wasn't because I was taking a risk. Because someone had won and someone had lost. Now, the point was not to look at them as losers, but they understood their place. As soon as you make a loser feel like a winner, undeservedly so, they suddenly feel, one second, I really won, maybe. It's the root of a lot of problems. So number one, when it comes to type of when there's a declaration, if there's no declaration of war, there's true peace, then obviously we give you the benefit of the doubt and let's sit down and negotiate. But if there's a declaration of war and the declaration of war was never rescinded, then you, have a, you need to be realistic. You can't be naive and convince yourself that the person who declared war on you is, no, they're very nice, they're smiling because they're not attacking you. But then comes the second half, that the true transformation comes once you change people's minds and feelings. Now, there are people working only on the second and not on the first, but you can't achieve the second if you don't have the first. If you don't have that show of strength, there's no way. Because then there's no, there's no reason, there's no incentive to change anything. I'll keep picking it, keep... The, 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 it'll be like a slow, bleeding death. I'll keep attacking you, attacking you, attacking you, with the belief that I may be victorious in some way. Even these missile attacks now, is it meant to really win a war? No, it's part of the resistance and part of public opinion and part of demonstrating we don't accept you. No one, no, everyone knows a war one-on-one -on -one would be similar results as in the Six-Day War and even the Yom Kippur War. And one final point I want to make. One final point, and that is that when it comes to situations of this nature, it's important to step back because you really want to see the whole picture. There are people that write that in history, 
whenever there is a refugee crisis, so where two sides are fighting each other, so either one kills out all the others. Example, case in point, the Indians in the United States. Or you banish them all. You don't let them live among you. Israel did not do that. Now some argue they should have. I'm not making that argument. No. They should have killed all the Arabs, Muslims. No. It's not the Jewish way, not the Torah way. They also didn't banish them. They let them remain there. Now there are consequences of that behavior. I'm not second-guessing what should have been, what could have been. Maybe Israel do it to its own, same way that it goes to these far lengths of protecting civilians, even of their enemies, and warning them, which also warns the enemy to get out of certain places before they attack. I mean, it's unprecedented in history. Can you imagine Americans warning the Nazis and saying, hey, get out of these buildings, we're about to bomb? The whole point of war is surprise. And there are consequences. Yes, civilians die. Okay, but that's another discussion. But going back to the point I'm making here, so maybe the Jewish people have this, this sensitive spot, this soft spot, that maybe comes from the fact that they were once, and they still are in many ways, were subjugated. Were, be kind to the stranger because you were once a stranger in another land, in Egypt, and so on. I'm not getting into the reasoning behind it, but it does have consequences. The consequences are that you have among you, not the thousand, millions of people, and not all of them maybe are your enemy, but they all sympathize with the enemy. So it brings me back, so then the only solution then is you have to have strength because you're dealing with a warlike situation. But the goal is not the strength and the war, the goal is the transformation that comes afterwards, and it could be done. So I don't know if this will be considered controversial or not, this conversation, this discussion. I call it a conversation because I definitely want to hear from you. But I definitely wanted to put these ideas on the table. You know, at least for discussion purposes. So will there ever be peace in the Middle East? It depends with which lens you look at. With certain eyes, it may not seem so. Especially if you look on the ground level and on the immediate and the history of the last decades or even centuries. But if you understand the bigger picture... With a, where it all originated from an Abraham, and you understand that there are religious passions at work here, and you're also very realistic in the approach, that you're not looking, you don't turn the other cheek, you come with strength. Strength creates peace. Strength with compassion. Strength with coming from a pure place. Not strength because I just want to be the one that wins, but lack of ambiguity, the key. Lack of ambiguity. This is right, this is wrong. That strength, coupled with a long-term strategy, could change the entire climate in the Middle East. And maybe it's connected to what we always talk about, the ultimate messianic dream, which seems sometimes so distant, but sometimes very close. I grew up in the environment. I grew up around my teachers and mentors that the messianic vision is not an unrealistic utopia. It's something within arm's reach. But it requires this, if you wish, paradox even, this balance of working from a position of strength, but with a goal of ultimately educating and teaching and transforming the entire region. In the words of the Bible, it says that when the judges sit in judgment in a court case, it says, V'shavto e'edavit silo that you shall judge. In other words, you have to find the correct judgment. You cannot be ambiguous and just be compassionate. But then it says, Vitzilu, and you shall save them. You shall preserve them. Because the whole point of the strength is to bring to a healthy situation, to peace, to harmony. Well, may God bless each of us. May God bless that region. May God bless everyone to have the deeper clarity that perhaps some new leaders will rise and understand the bigger picture here. And that at the end of the day, we're talking about the benefit of each one of us in the eyes of God. So even when you use the God argument to recognize that God created us all, and Abraham taught love, love for all. And even when there's a disagreement, violence and death and attacks is not the approach. The only time you use that, as I said, last resort, complete self-defense. The goal has to be transformation. 
I believe the Abraham Accords, interesting, they're called Abraham, are a light because even if the ulterior motives, if all the Arab countries in that region would make that type of peace with Israel, and we're not talking about a peace ignoring anyone or depriving anyone, a peace that will lead to prosperity for all, that is a wave of the future. No one expected that to happen either. It had to take some disruptive forces to do that. So may God bless us that we should continue to see a trend that brings to a deep peace, a true peace and harmony, and one where all the children of Abraham, all the children of God, can live side by side, complementing each other while also being diverse and unique with each their own individuality and their own belief system, all worshiping one God with many branches of one tree. This has been Simon Jacobson, MeaningfulLife.com. Please, your comments, your rebuttals, your arguments are all welcome. Let us be an, a living example of how we can have different opinions and yet be even more loving. MeaningfulLife.com. So please share. Please pass this on. Subscribe. Like all the different words used today. And I always look forward to sharing more words with you. Thank you. Be well and be healthy. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.